Hey there, hardcorers. This is Celestina, and over there on the other side of the earth is Miko. What's up, girl? Hi, everyone. We are slowing it down a little bit today. Hopefully, slowing it down a little bit today. And we're going to touch on some breath work um, in particular because this week has been a little bit wild and crazy. And I don't know, I can use it. I'm sure you can use it. But also because this is one of the techniques that Miko uses with her clients in her opportunity work. Um, but also just, I feel like it's amazing to have this knowledge. So we're here to share it with you today and also relate it a little bit, a lot of it to human design as we do. Thank you for the introduction. And yes, I'm super excited about this episode because let's get a little bit into breathing exercises in the first place, why it's important and why, if you haven't implemented that into your life yet, maybe it's time to do that. In the opportunity concept, breath is a major element. Breathing exercises are a major element because they are the connection between your physical body and your mind and emotions. So you have the physical body with which you breathe. So you take inhales and exhales with your lung and you, however, are able to balance your mind and emotions with breathing. So I'm going to give you a few examples here as this may help understand where I'm coming from. Because when you are happy, your breath changes. When you are sad, your breath changes. When you're angry, your breath changes. So no matter which kind of emotion you have, your breath will change. Either you're holding it or you're speeding it up or it becomes more shallow or deeper. So depending on which situation you're in, your breath shifts. So if your emotions can have that kind of impact on your breathing, your breath can also have that kind of impact on your emotions. So doing breathing exercises regularly is going to help you immensely to really balance out your emotions. Because when you breathe consciously, very regularly, you're going to be able to also control your breath in situations where it's usually difficult for you to control it. So for example, if you're standing in front of your boss and he really got you super angry and upset, you could simply take a few breaths instead of just releasing all of your pent up energy onto him and get fired. <laughs> So this will only, however, be possible once you've practiced this regularly, because if you think that I'm going to do some exercises today and then I'm going to skip it the, skip it the next few days and then I'm really going to use it just when the moment happens that I get angry and upset, you're not going to be able to do it because your emotions are going to be so much stronger and are really going to run run the show if you don't balance it out. However, breathing exercises is not the only way to do this. There are many, many things that you need to consider before stepping into breathing exercises. And I also work like this with the opportunity concept where I first help and support my clients in um, balancing out their environment where they're living and working help them bring balance into their diet and help them bring balance into their exercise routines. So physical movement. The environment also includes sleeping habits and we're going to today focus a lot on the environment aspect of your human design chart because this is a very big part of breathing exercises. So simply practicing breathing exercises is not all there is to it because you also need to be in the right environment, potentially even surrounded by the correct people. But for a lot of you, it's going to just be you, yourself and you, me, myself and I. Would you like to add something to that? I like that you're approaching this as it's more than just the breath work, right? Because I feel like when we think about breathing exercises, oftentimes we'll think of like a monk because that's where my mind goes, right? And like 
having to be in that like serenity or having to be in like a room without anything and just focusing on your third eye kind of thing. And yes, I think being in a temple of some sort could be really dope to do that, but it really is the environment that you're in and there's more to it than the physical environment. Are you feeling safe in that environment? Are you being nourished in that environment? Are you exhausted? Because I can tell you exhausted me doesn't want to do anything, right? So like there's so many steps to get your body, your mind prepped for just breathing and being cognizant of breathing than just like being like, okay, I'm going to breathe today. Yes, we breathe every day, like every minute of the day, but I think it's different, the concepts that you're talking about. So all I'm trying to say is that it's, it's more than just the breathing aspect of it, right? Like it's, there's different steps that affect your life before this can become a more integral part of your life. So love that you touched on that. Yeah, absolutely. And also, I mean, the opportunity concept cannot be taught to someone who's in survival mode. There are just things that need to be a base, a cover for you to even think about taking the next steps. If you're in a war zone, all you're thinking about is how I'm going to get food, how I'm going to survive and get the right shelter, how am I going to, if you have a family and friends, how I'm going to keep them safe and myself safe. So there are things that just need to be a given before you can even have the luxury of working on breath. And one of these aspects is as well mindfulness. So before you can even recognize that your breath has such an impact on your life, you need to also practice mindfulness. And this is something I always go back to every, all the time over and over and over again. Because I think this is something that every single one of us should practice and should get to know. Because the more that you practice being in the present moment. So mindfulness for everyone that doesn't know what it is. And uh, you may have been living under a rock if you haven't heard about this yet. Because this is in everyone's mouth. <laughs> but mindfulness is often confused with meditation and it is a form of meditation but it's not meditation so it is something that you can do at any point in time you can even do it right now listening to this podcast or watching this podcast by observing your five senses being in the present moment observing your five senses whatever it is you're looking at right now observing the colors the shadow the light the reflections all of these things, using your eyes to observe everything, using your ears to hear everything around you, using your nose to smell everything around you, using your hands and your body parts to touch things around you, or even just feel a sensation on your clo of your clothes on your skin. And if you just had something to drink or eat, then you can even still taste the world around you. And this is something we're going to touch on on this topic today with taste and breath. But uh, before we get into that, it's let's focus back on mindfulness. And another thing that you do while being mindful is you let go of your thoughts. You're not latching onto thoughts. And that's what I mean by being in the present moment, because there is no past. There is no future in the present moment. There's just now. So you literally just focus on what is happening right now around you and also even within you. What are you feeling? And by doing that and doing this regularly every day, multiple times a day, this is not a one time, one and done thing. It's really an every once in a while throughout the day, whenever you can remember or you can set yourself an alarm and you can do it at any point in time, no matter where you are. You don't have to step out of the room to go be mindful. You can do it wherever you are. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is because once you become more and more mindful of the world around you, but also your internal world, you're going to recognize these triggers, these emotional triggers much faster. And you're going to then be able to use your breath because you're going to feel the sensations rising. So if you're again in front of your boss and 
he got you very angry and upset, you're going to feel it in your body. You're going to feel the sensations, the anger, the upsetness within your body. And you're then going to be able to breathe and calm yourself down or simply step away from the situation <laughs> and then breathe. Breathing is just essential to everything. <laughs> But uh, yeah, this is just a little bit about as well mindfulness and going again on to how many things need to come before stepping into the ex breathing exercises. So the next aspect I would like to mention on this topic is to look at your chart. And you would then first look at your circuitry, how much tribal circuitry do you have? How much individual circuitry do you have? How much collective circuitry do you have? We haven't done an episode yet on circuitry, so we're going to be doing that in the future. And for now, if you do understand what that means, as a tribal being, if you have a lot of tribal energy in your chart, you're most likely going to enjoy breathing exercises with others. So this can be literal breathing exercises as in you're doing pranayama work, you're doing um, yogic breathing exercises or Buddhist monk breathing exercises. So that the, the Wim Hof method, for example. So there are many different things that you can do, but you probably enjoy doing it with others. This can also, however, be singing in the choir. This can be going to a comedy club and laughing. Laughing is an amazing breathing exercise, even though it's often not considered a breathing exercise, but it really is. I mean, it engages your diaphragm. It, 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 it releases happy hormones. So it's definitely a breathing exercise in my book. And if you have a lot of individual circuitry, you're probably more likely to enjoy doing breathing exercises on your own by yourself. However, if we're looking at other elements in your chart, like the environment, you really need to be mindful where you're doing your breathing exercises because there are environments that are not correct for you. So the first things that you would be working on in human design and in life in general, in my opinion, my, my personal opinion, <laughs> is you would be working on your environment. Where is the right environment for me? And this becomes relevant at around after 30, after your Saturn return. It becomes more and more relevant. You can also start using it on kids as well, but it's not as crucial for them to be in the correct environment. In After your 30s, it becomes more important. So this is the first part you would really hone in and understand your environment and where to take, where to do these breathing exercises. And the other part is your diet. And we have a registered dietitian here. So let's take her outlook on nutrition and how important it is to really balance out your nutrition and feed your body with the right food so that it can have the energy that it needs to move you through life okay big caveat here is this is also like if you're in a place where you can afford the things right like if you feel like you're paycheck to paycheck feed yourself with how you can feed yourself and your family right so i feel like that's that's utmost importance um and i think sometimes we forget about that with nutrition as a whole right so just take that with a caveat. But yeah, I don't believe that there's one correct diet out there for people. And I also don't like the word diet, right? Because it's, then that implies that something's being missed or uh, we're excluding something. And really the more variety you can put into your body, as long as your body likes those foods and you're not allergic to them, the better, right? But also we've done We've done a human design episode on like taste and what that is, right? And like your specific nutrition for your body. So explore some of that as well, because I've noticed that the more I've been able to lean into that and rather than following like a specific regimen, 
that I learned in my like academic studies that I've felt better, that I've had more energy. Um, so I think that there is definitely something to following the nutrition for your design, right? Again, take that with a grain of salt, do your own experimenting, explore into that. But the more you can have variety in your life, right? So like 20 different kinds of fruits, veggies, nuts, and seeds a week, the better. If you can aim for that, amazing. I'm not going to say don't do animal proteins, right? Because that's a carnivorous life or a non-carnivorous life. A vegetarian life isn't for everyone, right? But if you know where your food is coming from and it's not like ridiculously filled with chemicals, again, this is coming from a POV of privilege. So take this with that same grain of salt and understanding, right? But like if you know where your food is coming from and you can choose foods that don't have a ton of chemicals in them and they're not heavily processed, the better. The more they look like the recognizable fruit, veggie, whatever it is, the better. But yeah, I, I don't, I don't um, subscribe to any one particular diet because we're all made completely differently and some people work with fasting and like that's good for their bodies but i can tell you that if i don't eat when i'm feeling exhausted i will crumble <laughs> <laughs> yeah and and this is also again the beautiful thing about human design it really shows you how different we are it's the science of differentiation or it's known as the science of differentiation and not um it's showing us just many different aspects of how people can be and it helps us respect their differences as well and understand them so if you're out and about with someone who's very very picky in what they eat or maybe they eat the same thing over and over and over again don't get upset at them it's normal <laughs> it may be normal for them depending on their design or they may be conditioned this is also a thing so quick little side note on this i was sitting at a park the other day and i was just like watching this couple eat the roasted chicken that they bought i know so random but like <laughs> they i don't know anything about them or their human designs but i thought it was very interesting neither environment nor like, is it it's digestion related it is i'm pretty sure um the woman was like doing this with her knee the whole time she was like bouncing her her leg up and down right so like active and she she didn't do it when they weren't eating but the whole time they were eating she was like bouncing her leg up and down i was like damn in my mind that would be super annoying but for her it's probably really helpful for her to digest so i just thought that that was really interesting to be able to witness someone who has the high activity aspect of it uh potentially in their digestion so quick little side note interesting For me, this, um, th yeah, you may be right that this is something that helps her. To me, uh, someone that has this, well, okay, this is extreme, diagnosing it with restless leg syndrome, but uh, someone that just keeps moving their legs, whether it's someone being active or passive in their environment or digestion, I don't really think that is a healthy expression. I think more it is just a lot of pent up energy and it shows that people are not moving enough. So she may have been a generator or manifesting generator and she, and she may have a lot of motor centers and she doesn't release that energy consistently or enough. And that's why she's having this um, just constantly moving because I'm a f I have all my four arrows to the left. However, I'm not a, ma a generator or manifesting generators and I only have one motor, but I have never had this constant moving thing. I know that generators, kids especially, or manifesting generator kids, or if you do have a lot of motors, even as a projector or a manifester, if you have the other motors defined, then you can have a lot of energy inside of you. And if you don't release it, you're going to be stuck with it inside of your body and you won't be able to, to release it any other way than just constantly moving. And I think this is a big reason why people are being diagnosed with ADHD 
when it's just so much more simple. We, we just need to go back into nature more, move more, have the kids run around more, um, not complain when they're bouncing up and down at the restaurant. Instead, you should have probably taken them to the park more or I don't know, it's just many different reasons and avoid sit sitting them in front of the screen. Even though, of course, I totally get it. Trust me, I know how difficult it can be to have kids and sometimes you just want the easy solution. So no blame here. Um, it's just that if before, before giving them Adderall or some tablets or even diagnosing them because a diagnosis can be very detrimental in itself as well because you then start to identify with it and start to think that something's wrong with you and it's just energy, pent up energy that hasn't been released in some cases. Of course, not every case. That was a great little sidetrack. Love that for us. <laughs> yeah, had nothing to do with breathing exercises. Back on the topic, thank you for getting us back. So the first thing you would look at would be, the second thing you would look at because we already covered the circuitries. So the second thing you would look at is environment. And your environment shows you where you should be practicing your breathing exercises. So yes, you can have an active environment. That means that your arrow would be pointing to the left. That is the bottom left arrow on the unconscious side of your design, the red arrow often, or simply just on the unconscious side of your design in the nodes your environment would be, your environmental arrow would be pointing to the left. That is an active environment. And that does mean that your environment should motivate you to move. It shouldn't motivate you to sit still and relax. It's really more about having things move around in your outside world and you being motivated to do the same because of your outside world. So if you have your bottom left arrow pointing to the right, that would make your environment a passive environment. And that means that you would thrive in a calmer environment, a place that lets you relax and, and slow down, wind down. So what happens when you create your environments like this or when if you choose a working environment that is more relaxing, if you're a right arrow and a working environment that is more active, if you're left arrow, it, it can help you thrive more. It can help you be more inspired. It can help you be healthier. It can help you on many, many different ways because it's, it's basically the foundation for your physical body. It's just like a house. If you choose the right land, so in this case, if you choose the right landscape for your body, it can thrive and can be stable and still balanced and flexible at the same time. So that's what we're trying to do. So first, understand if you're a passive or active environment and also choose to do your breathing exercises in such an environment. So if you are an active arrow, and you're going to choose to go all the way up onto a mountain without anyone around you and everything completely calm and nothing is moving, it's probably not the best environment for you to breathe. If you're a mountain person, on the other hand, it could still be a little bit better, but it's still not ideal. So you still kind of need movement and, um, and be inspired to move. So... The next thing is you would look at your environments. So you would take a look at whether, so whichever, whichever environment is stated in your human design chart. Would you like to add something to that for now? I think that's such a good perspective to have because you may not have the same, like I was just looking at David's chart and my chart together, right? You may not have the same environment as your partner, even if 
I don't know, your relaxation may be different. And I think that that's also really important to note. Yes, for you as an individual, but also knowing yourself in a group environment or if you if you do benefit from being in a group space or an individual space or a space where you need to get away from everyone, that's me, I feel you, um, versus being in a space, right? So like if you're doing breathing exercises in a retreat space, maybe you're going for a, I'm just throwing it out there, but maybe you're going for a smaller, more niche retreat where you do have the opportunity to go away and be in your own space versus, I don't know, um, like a, a larger space where you're, you're doing breathing exercises with a whole bunch of people, right? So knowing, this is super important because knowing what's right for you will also help you choose the opportunities in your world that come up for you. So yeah, maybe you want to start breathing on your own and this is invigorating you to start breathing on your own, but maybe that next step for you <clears throat> would be to do it with someone else. But seeing if that's right for you, I think is also really important. So these insights are fantastic. Yeah, um, you made a good point in also, of course, choosing the right places to go as retreat wise and also understanding your partner again in this. Yes, absolutely. It may what may be right for you may not be right for them. So always a good, uh, a good thing to keep in mind when you're living in a partnership or with family members as well. Or if you're living with friends. So The environments, we're going to start with line, uh, with, with the color one. So this is caves in this case. And caves individuals would probably prefer to be in their own space. If you have a lot of tribal energy, you can still invite people to your home. Uh, to your space. It doesn't have to just be your home. It can also be a, a yoga studio that feels very cozy and safe for you, for example. So caves are need to, need to feel safe in their environment. Um, you shouldn't have any, any door or window behind your back. There should be a wall so that you feel safe and protected. And also caves are often very selective on who they let into their homes. So also when you're doing breathing exercises with someone else, if you're doing them with someone else, you don't have to. You can also simply choose to do it in your own safe space. But for you, it would be best to do it in a safe space, not to do it in the middle of the forest, because this is your safe space is where you can cleanse and release all the negative energies. So yeah, choose the people right choose the well choose your people well <laughs> that you do the breathing exercises with do you know any cave people no i don't know any cave people at least not off the top of my head i'm sure they exist <laughs> yeah, yeah they do <laughs> yeah it's interesting because it's also a lot of times um people would feel that i need to live in a cave without windows and i have to kind of but it's it's not that way it's not that extreme it's more regarding the safety aspect yes you may like it more dim you don't need such bright lights but some cave people really enjoy having big windows but at least have this protective space behind them or just spaces to also retrieve so then we have markets and with markets It is about information exchange. So you like to be in the information field, hustle and bustle, understand what is happening, um, gathering all the information that you can around you. You may also even enjoy being in literal markets or market spaces. This can be a food market the skin or supermarket or literal market or <laughs> um, places where you deal with financial things as well so it, it can be many different spaces and for you there is either an internal market or an external market so if the arrow is pointing left you are internal if the arrow is pointing right you are external markets and it's really 
Mm, the internal markets would be more focused on an internal space as well, while the external market would be also more focused on an external space. So let's take an example of being in a park. Also, you can be in a park with people, but you can simply, if you're an external market, you can simply be in a park surrounded by people and do your breathing exercises there. So this would be a place where a lot of people are communicating, talking, exchanging information. There's a lot of movement and you can still be by yourself in this place. An internal market would be a similar area where you would be inside instead of an outside space where things are being exchanged. This can be cafes or places like this and breathing exercises don't have to be obvious. You don't have to be sitting there doing Nadi Shodana where you're using a specific mudra. You can simply inhale and exhale deeply and this already is going to provide you with cleansing. It's interesting because the one external markets person that I know is also a reflector. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I need to observe this person now and kind of just <laughs> garner some more insights. But yeah, it's it's interesting when you look at it from different layers, right? Because, I mean, you can be external markets, for example, and be any of the types. So it's interesting how the type then layers on a different aspect to it, I would assume as well. So it's it's just really cool to be able to kind of unravel all of that in my mind. You're totally right. And it's also good to mention this again here before we lose track of this, because it's always important to take a look at the rest of the chart. And we mentioned this over and over again, you need to look at the entire chart and put it into perspective with all the information in there as well, because we do have um, Pluto and Saturn that are based on exhalation and inhalation. So Pluto is inhalation and Saturn is about exhalation. So looking at the gates and the lines in these planets is again going to provide you with yet another layer. You're still going to understand more about where and how you best inhale and exhale and which one you should focus on more and how you can really, the exhale is going to provide you with information on how you can release the pent up energy. The inhale is going to provide you with information, not just literally about inhaling and exhaling, but also taking in things, taking in information as well, because it's as fine as breath, if you think about it. It's a different process mechanism, but it's still an energetic process. So yeah, a very good point to also, of course, keep in mind the rest of the chart. <laughs> the next one we're going to be talking about is kitchens. And here we have wet kitchens and dry kitchens. And in this case, the kitchens enjoy places that are also um, a very active environment a lot of like not it doesn't have to be active or passive because wet kitchens would be active in my environment dry kitchens would be passive environment but I mean they do like to be in the center of what is in what is happening right now what is en vogue so all of all of this for the kitchen people it's very enticing <laughs> And they also like places where things come together, where if maybe you're in a literal kitchen where you bring ingredients together or you're in an art space where you put paints and and uh, materials together, you can be in a mechanics shop where you put all the parts together to create a car, things like this. So the thing that I would focus on here though is that whether you're a wet or a dry kitchen, because when it comes to breathing exercises and your wet kitchen, you would thrive more if you have a very humid, if you have very humid breathing or air conditions. So it's more favorable if you are a wet kitchen that you inhale maybe. So if you're sick, for example, and you want to treat yourself, inhaling essential oils for a wet kitchen would be through fumes 
like boiling water, putting some drops inside and inhaling the fumes. For a dry kitchen, I would recommend using a tissue instead, putting the oils on a tissue and inhaling the, the essences of the oils from the tissue. And this is the similar aspect regarding breathing exercises. If you are a wet kitchen, keep your environment humid. Try to use not a dehumidifier, but add humidity to your environment. And also prefer spaces that are humid. Saunas, for example, that are humid instead of dry. If you're a dry kitchen, prefer saunas and breathe in saunas, for example, that are dry and use a dehumidifier if you can. I know several kitchens, but you being a kitchen yourself, I'd love to know how breathing felt when you were in Saudi Arabia versus whether it be Germany Bali. or Bali or India, all of the other very moist environments. <laughs> Good question. Yeah, the Saudi Arabia was a big challenge for me. It was the, when I arrived the first time, it was nearly 50 degrees and it was dry as a fan, like as if you would hold a blow dryer in your face and that's what it felt like. And I, I could literally feel my thyroid when I was breathing. It was so uncomfortable. Yeah. I, and this is the first time I really noticed how impactful it is for me. And now that I think back, when I first went to Egypt, I was a I was a teenager and I was so exhausted. I, I couldn't handle this heat. And now looking back, I can understand why I feel like it's not regarding the heat necessarily because I thrive in humid, hot climates. I love heat, but I do need humidity. And most people, they can't stand humid heat. Most people tell me, oh, I, my, my clothes are sticking. And yeah, it is uncomfortable. That, that part I totally agree with. But I feel so good breathing in these places. Like one of my absolute favorite things from childhood, because we traveled a lot, a lot, a lot when I was a child. And still I travel a lot. But one of my absolute favorite things is to exit an airplane and to be hit by this hot humid wall <laughs> this for me is heaven as soon as i can smell that and feel it in my lungs and i'm just like oh my god this is so good because as well the airplane is super dry and it's so uncomfortable and then you enter into such a space that is super humid yeah this is this is my wet kitchen's perspective my mom is the entire opposite because she's a dry kitchen so every time she's she's in a super hot, deserty place, that's where she thrives. This is where she can breathe. And yeah, it's it's interesting to see. Yeah, it's wild. Walking off of an airplane, like I went to school in Rhode Island. So like leaving the moist environment and like flying back to my parents' house in Vegas, I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I would be like, no. <laughs> so funny okay yeah that being said we should also mention that kitchens don't always have to be hot environments they can also be cold environments so just fyi for everyone that's thinking okay i don't like the desert and i don't like the rainforest um i like antarctica perfectly fine <laughs> It, it has nothing to do with temperature. It's more about humidity. Then mountains, we have active. Would you like to say something about that? I was going to make a silly kitchen joke, but it's probably going to go over everyone's head. So it's fine. Keep going. I want to hear it. Whether you're working at Garmanger station and it's all cold or you work in a grill station, right? It's not really a joke. <laughs> I guess it's just a comparison. Okay. You're welcome, everyone. I'm totally going to send this to my friend who is a chef. <laughs> I'm going to have him translate this to me. <laughs> okay. Mountains. Active mountains or passive mountains? Mountains is a very interesting one when it comes to breathing exercises because I would recommend a mountain, depending on the rest of their chart, but most likely I would recommend a mountain 
to literally climb higher, like go higher up, as in either be in a on a literal mountain or go up on a skyscraper or at least be, if you're living in a house, be on a higher floor instead of the lower floor. So when it comes to breathing exercises, what you're trying to do as a mountain is actually reduce the oxygen that is coming into your body. So you should focus more on the exhales than on the inhales because you thrive with having less ox oxygen in your body. So if you are a passive mountain, you can literally climb on top of a mountain, be by yourself and just enjoy the lack of oxygen. So what an example that Ra was giving is that when you are working at a very high, on a, on a skyscraper and you're working on a very high floor of that skyscraper and then in the evening you go back down and you have to go home. It could be that you feel more depressed when leaving work because when you're up there as an active mountain, for example, or a passive mountain, like just generally a mountain, you will have this lower oxygen level. But once you go back down to the lower ground, you won't feel as good in your body anymore. So. That's also something to keep in mind if this happens to you and you're living, you're working on in a skyscraper or maybe you're living in a skyscraper and then you have to go to work. <laughs> also an option that you then feel less energized. The next one is valleys. So we have wide valleys and narrow valleys and this is about sound. So individuals that have wide or narrow valleys, they're very focused on sound. They want to hear what is going on, what is, what is happening around them. And in narrow valleys, you thrive more when you understand where the sound is coming from. So wearing headphones can be beneficial and this can also be something that can help you while doing breathing exercises. While wide valleys often don't enjoy wearing headphones. And my brother is a narrow valley and he wears headphones and he mutes the sound so that he doesn't hear anything around him. And while that may drive his wife crazy sometimes, <laughs> at least it would drive me crazy. I'm not saying it does her, but... When you're calling him and he doesn't hear you, <laughs> he's very, very happy and content in his little world because he knows where the sound is coming from. Like, for example, if you're hearing this, the birds outside right now, he can't locate the bird. He doesn't understand where it's coming from. It can upset him. If it's a constant, there is a bird. You can actually hear the one bird that always bothers my brother. And this bird drives him crazy when he doesn't know where the sound is coming from. So that's why he uses his mute. So the, the noise cancelling setting on his headphones a lot. And this can also help you with breathing exercises. Using music to breathe instead of just silent breathing wide valley perspective over here hey yo so <laughs> i find that so i've lived in physical valleys and i've lived not in physical valleys and i can tell you that i like being in a physical valley significantly more than like living by the ocean for example and not that i was like not that all the days there were like fan fucking tastic but there is something about being in the environment. Like you said, over 30, right? Like there's something about being in the environment and just feeling this like more groundedness. Yeah. When it comes to breathing, I can tell you that. So it's interesting because I actually did just get some noise canceling headphones and you guys have probably seen me wear them on here. I love them, but it makes me very uncomfortable to not be able to hear myself breathing. It's really weird. It's a like, and, or maybe it's because I can hear myself breathing. I don't know why, but wearing the noise canceling headphones, like while I'm doing a task, 
it's nice because I can block out the bogan. If you're in Australia or from Australia, you know what I'm saying? Block out the bogan on the bus. It's blocking out, like, I don't know, like the, the riffraff on the bus, like the whatever. Anyway, blocking out the bogan. But it also makes me very uncomfortable, and I get a little bit dizzy when I walk with them. So it's just, it's very interesting to, to have you, that. And now, yeah. For you, it's actually, I mean, that's what I'm saying. The narrow values, yeah. they enjoy the headphones cancellation. The wide yeah. values, not so much. No. And it's... They prefer but to, I like, like... Go ahead. They, they prefer to, to hear sounds further away. As in, for yeah. you, it would be more like a sa surround system. That for you would be great, but headphones not not your ideal. No, and it's so interesting because so like when I'm in a cafe, typically I won't wear headphones. In Germany, I did not wear headphones because I couldn't understand the people around me anyway. So it was like this. It was like white noise. It was beautiful, and then I got to understand German a little bit more, and I was like, ah, oh, I can like kind of understand their conversation. And that's super annoying, but I think you're right. It really. Well, I know you're right because. The noise canceling headphones make me feel ill, but <laughs> me too. Having like the external sound and being able to like just be me in that external sound is so much more comforting than headphones on blocking out the world. Yeah, yeah. wild. <laughs> so yeah, when doing breathing exercises and you're a narrow valley, then you may enjoy wearing headphones and listening to sound. So it doesn't even have to be blocked out. You have to play around with that. Um, I was just saying that for my brother, when he's doing a task, he wears the noise canceling and then he can focus on the music and he can focus on his task. Or he sometimes doesn't even play music. He just cancels out the noises around him. But uh, if you're a wide valleys, you may enjoy just listening to um, music coming from music boxes or just simply hearing the sounds around you without having something very focused on your ears. Then we have the last one, shores. So shores, you have natural and artificial shores. Natural is when your arrow is pointing to the left, artificial is when your arrow is pointing to the right. And this can be literal shores, as in for the natural, it can be literal shores that you're at the ocean or at a river bank, or also riding a bike, like, or doing anything that is in balance, where you can look to the left and to the right. It can be a canoe, a canoe, can, canoe, canoe, I think. So you're basically in balance on something. It can be a skateboard, it can be uh, whatever, whatever it may be, where you have to kind of balance yourself and you still have both sides to look at. You have the left and the right. So the short people enjoy that kind of thing where they have everything under control. So when you're on a boat, for example, you still can can see to the right and to the left and often maybe see the shore and then see the width of the ocean. So having this this thing in the middle, that can really, shore people may really enjoy this. And on the other side, you have the artificial shores, which may be more of an artificial environment, as in you may be sh sitting, you may be sitting on your porch and you can still see the outside world moving around in front of your house, but you also kind of have a look on the inside world, what is happening. So you're basically on the edge of something. And this is what shore people really enjoy. They like to see both sides of things. They may also like to be on a border of something, maybe Switzerland and Germany, for example, and they can still see both sides of things or an urban area and a city area being on the brink of it. When it comes to breathing exercises, the natural shores may really enjoy having, you know, this this air breeze of the ocean breeze of when you're standing at the ocean to really have this this smooth flow of air and still being able to look out into the ocean or the lake or something like this. And the artificial shores, they may just 
try to experiment with this. Maybe you enjoy doing breathing exercises while balancing on something or while, um, while observing from your porch, as an example, if you have a porch or a balcony, for example. So just having as well something to observe around you where you can see one thing cross over to the next could also be next to train tracks for example even though that wouldn't be necessarily the healthiest place to do breathing exercises <laughs> but i'm just giving examples here okay <laughs> i don't think i know shore people so can't give any insights there sorry guys <laughs> Yeah, I also only knew, know a few and I don't really know if I've talked to them about this aspect. So yeah, this is just a little bit about breathing exercises and where you should be located to breathe. Don't take these environments as literal as they are a lot of times. So you can, of course, play around with what it's literally saying. But a lot of times when I say someone that they're a kitchen environment, they're like, oh, I hate the kitchen. <laughs> I get that a lot. Um, but I think they just didn't understand the, 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 the ingredients yet and what they can do in the kitchen. <laughs> it's magic. Yeah, I also didn't like the kitchen when I was little, but now I, I love it. And But it's also... Of course, I'm an ego projector, so it has to be the right time. I can't just do it willy-nilly all the time, like a generator may be able to do it. I need the right time for my cooking. <laughs> but yeah, so don't take it too literal. Play around with it. Um, decode it for yourself as well. Listen to your intuition always, your inner authority. And... Also, there is more to it, as always. So as I mentioned, Pluto and Saturn play a big role in it. And you you can look at many different aspects in your chart as well regarding, um, yeah, just type and um, just to stay, stick to the basics and channels and how the centers are connected and split definitions and, yeah, many, many different things to take into consideration. And if they want to learn more about that, how can they work with you? Oh, they can take a look at the Opportunity website. We are linked. We are both linked in the Hardcore Instagram site. So, yeah, you can contact us there anytime and also provide us with some feedback, either through the podcast platform that you're listening to. Spotify does a good job on in that. You can also provide feedback on YouTube and simply message us on Hardcore on Instagram. Amazing. Thanks for taking the lead on this today, Miko. Appreciate it. And sharing all of your wisdom, knowledge about breathing and how one can best do that based off of their human design environment. Thank you very much for being here and for providing your, how did you call it? Quips. Quips. My sassy <laughs> little quips. <laughs> yes. Thank you. And thank you everyone for listening. Appreciate you he having here and hope to see you again next time. Ciao. Bye.